can you guys, okay, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, so I'll just start with the introduction. Uh, Tyler Zappel, is that correct? Okay. From the, he is the Director of Policy and Research for the Bell Policy Center. He's here on the end. Um, he joined the Public Policy Center from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government Performance Lab, where he acted as Program Director. And prior to that, he held positions at the office of Mayor Michael Bloomberg in New York City and the New York City Department of Small Business Services, the Senate Banking Committee, and the Executive Office of the President. And next to him is House Speaker Casey Becker. Uh, she represents uh, House District 13, which includes parts of Boulder County on all of Clear Creek, Gilpin, and Grand, and Jackson counties. And she wants you to know that it's the only House District that spans the continental divide. <laughs> Uh, she also served on the Boulder City Council and worked briefly in real estate, but most of her career was at the Department of the Interior, working on environmental and natural resource law. Uh, next to her is Michael Fields, who is the Executive Director of Colorado Revising Action. And now I Oh, there you go. Should know all this about you already. <laughs> Uh, he was previously the Senior Director of Issue Education uh, for Americans for Prosperity and the State Director of AFP Colorado. He's also served as a policy aide at the Colorado State House and a press aide for the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. And then last but not least is Frank McNaught, who used to be Speaker at the Colorado House. Uh, he served um, in House of District uh, 43, which is Highlands Ranch in Northern Douglas County. He was there in 2008, 2010, and 2012. And so then I just have a couple of quick housekeeping uh, things. I'm gonna, I have questions for everybody, and then I'll give you like four to five minutes to answer, and then if somebody from the opposition wants to respond, I'll give you about a minute to respond, if that makes, sounds fair to everyone. And so I thought I'd start by explaining what Proposition CC is going to ask voters this November. Um, it's going to ask whether you want to unwind part of the state constitution uh, that was uh, from the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. And the part that it's asking you to unwind is that formula that Carol was just talking about. So population plus the rate of inflation to determine how much bigger government can get each year. And so what the proponents want to do is to take that part away for state government and to spend the money on transportation and education. So I will start with the supporters of CC. And I should, I guess I should point out that that is uh, Casey and Tyler over here. Um, so Colorado voters have rejected every statewide ballot question about raising taxes, even for education and transportation. Uh, so why is CC different? CC is different because it's not actually a tax increase. The ballot measure begins without raising taxes. Can the state keep and spend the money voters are already sending it and spend it in two areas, transportation and public education? It does not actually unwind anything in the Constitution. It's not a constitutional amendment. Tabor says, voter, you have spending, you have revenue limits at every level of government, but you can change that revenue limit just by asking voters. So go ask voters. So this measure is asking voters. You're already sending us 4.63 in income tax and 2.9 in sales tax, but we're not allowed to keep in many years that revenue and spend it on state priorities. We just wanna be able to keep and spend the revenue you're already collecting and spend it on public education and roads, bridges, and transit. Um, sure. So I think it's a good question that you ask on why have the last six statewide tax increases gone down, uh, most of which by a huge margin. I think uh, legislators who are pushing this stuff forward aren't asking that question. There was $10 million spent on Amendment 66. Just last year, uh, their transportation tax increase, $8.5 million. Uh, Amendment 73, education, $3.5 million. There's not a lack of resources pushing out a message. Uh, it's that the people uh, don't want to increase the growth of government, and that's because it's been growing. Um, you know, you look at our state budget, it is $32.5 billion. It's going up a billion dollars each and every year. 
And while this ballot issue, it isn't an amendment, it is a statute, therefore, it says it's gonna to go to education and transportation. Uh, there's no guarantee that that happens. This is basically a blank check to the legislature to spend on whatever they want. Or if they do spend it on education and transportation, they'll do what happened with REF-C and move the money they're currently spending on those things somewhere else in the budget. So I think the fact that it's a blank check, the fact that it is a tax increase, uh, and our state budget is growing so much, uh, I think that's why voters have rejected the previous and will reject this tax increase too. Sure. So I think it's a little disingenuous to say, Tabor just tells you to go ask voters. And when you go ask voters, say, oh, but you can't trust them because they're not really going to do that. Um, nothing in statute, everything that is in law can be changed by another law. So that's not any different with, than this than anything else, right? That is the nature of law. That's the nature of n the next elected official gets to rethink anything that's happened. Um, he mentioned, oh, all this money going into these ballot measures. I think you were actually mentioning what was spent for them and what was spent against them. Um, people are, <clears throat> through those, it's very, very difficult to get voters to approve tax increases. That's absolutely true. What we're seeing is the tax cuts that happened in the past in Colorado are really negatively impacting our ability as a state to make important investments. As Carol pointed out, we cut the income tax, we cut the sales tax, and because gas tax is flat and hasn't been increased in 27 years, and yet construction costs go up, it's, it's an effective tax cut. So Colorado keeps having tax cuts, and yet we keep having growth in our state that we are not able to keep up with the impacts of growth in our state because we have prohibited the state in our constitution, we've constitutionally prohibited the state from growing at the same rate that the economy grows. If we want to make important investments in education, because we are one of the lowest funded K-12 states in the entire country, and if we want to make investments in transportation, we should at least be able to keep the taxes we are already collecting and spend them on those important priorities. Actually, that kind of leads into a question I have for the opponents of CC. So uh, either one of you is that, um, you know, CDOT says we have a multi-billion dollar transportation project backlog. If uh, this isn't uh, part of the solution, then what should be the solution? How do, how do we get from A to B on those projects? Uh, I, I do appreciate that question, and uh, surprisingly enough, the speaker and I might differ on this one. <laughs> so we used to have a system in Colorado where um, the state didn't just have revenue. Tabor is a revenue limit. But the state had a state spending limit, where the state budget could only increase 5% from year to year. This was in existence for the majority of the 90s into the early 2000s wasn't repealed until uh, 20, uh, 2011. So all of this time, the state had an annual spending limit. Everything above that limit that came in and below the Tabor limit was spent on roads, was spent on bridges, was spent on infrastructure and capital construction. So when times were good and the state economy was humming along and the state had more money, that money went into roads, bridges, capital construction. When that law was um, repealed in 2011, all of a sudden all bets were off and money was spent through the roof. And surprisingly, or perhaps unsurprisingly, none of that, that money was not spent on roads or bridges or capital construction. The money that we, the backlog we have for our state buildings is getting worse and worse. And when you don't fix a leaky roof and it keeps leaking, you end up paying more to fix it in the long run. These are the types of things that were managed back when we had what were, what were referred to as Senate Bill $1. So when times were good, we had money for roads, we invested in bridges, we invested in capital construction. And there's another important public policy piece of that. And that is when times are bad, when the economy goes into recession, and state spending inevitably drops because revenue to the state drops, fewer people are hurt. So that first cushion 
We don't let contracts to build roads. We don't let contracts to build bridges. We don't let contracts to repair buildings. But we're not cutting K-12 education. We're not kicking people off of publicly subsidized health care. Now, things did get worse in the early two, in the mid-2000s. Things did get worse, and we did end up having to reduce spending in those areas. But that was only after we went through this long list of other stuff where the state didn't build roads, it didn't build bridges, it didn't maintain the capital construction line items. But immediately, we didn't start kicking people off of health care. We didn't start cutting funds to K-12 education. So I think the solution is to reinstate a state spending limit, then anything in excess of that goes to roads, bridges, and capital construction. When times are good, you invest in these hard assets that the state needs. That would be my first step. Um, I'll just add one thing here, if that's okay. Um, yeah, so the number one, if you poll issues around the state, the number one issue is our infrastructure needs, our transportation, uh, the fact that it needs fixing across the board. Doesn't matter what party, doesn't matter what age, everybody wants our roads fixed. Um, I think the, pro the problem that we have is that we've had three promises. If you remember, and we've talked about this some today, Ref C passed, money was supposed to go to roads. Now that's $2.1 billion still going into the budget each year. Faster fees went up 2009, $250 million per year, increasing your car registration fees. Then hospital provider fee passed, 600 more million dollars, much of which is supposed to go to transportation. So we've spent almost $3 billion more every year into our budget, and that money's not going to fix roads. So I think, you know, looking at it and saying, also with CC, you can't bond for roads if you don't know how much money you're gonna get, right? So you can't increase teacher pay, you can't bond for roads. What we should do is take the money, they did put some more money into transportation the last two years, but they need to make that long-term bond for it, fix our highways, not send money to, to local areas that can deal with that problem on their own. Uh, the Sun had a great article on that, but looking at it and saying, we've had promise after promise after promise that money's gonna go to roads, it's not going there. I mean, I think I didn't hear the answer of how um, Proposition CC does not help here. Um, and I think that's the important part. We have both, as we just stated, almost a $9 billion gap when it comes to underfunded transportation projects in our state. We have, under, we have over six million, $600 million just to bring our schools up to um, inflation adjusted. It's not to talk about actually getting to a level that we desire in our schools. It's almost a billion dollars to bring our higher education system up to levels that we saw pre-recession. And contrary to what we heard, we, and kind of the experience that we had today, we have a general fund budget of only around $12 billion to solve that. Um, so it's one of those, unless you want to see dramatic cuts, unless you want to actually take people's um, uh, health care away from them, if you actually want to um, dramatically reduce our education system, we have to be able to take advantage of revenue when times are good. Because when times are bad, we're going to have to actually make more dramatic cuts that are going on. So this is one step in that large direction, but to fundamentally keep Colorado competitive for many years to come, we're going to have to do much more than just Proposition CC and being able to maintain um, the funding that we're getting in these good time periods. So uh, I actually did want to ask uh, Speaker Becker a specific question, which is you have made it clear that CC won't spot solve the funding shortfalls for either education or transportation. You call it a common sense first step. Um, so then what else should the state be doing? And if CC fails, what could lawmakers realistically do in 2020 to address these problems? So I think that um, this debrucing, fixing the problem of can the state keep the money it's already collecting, is a first step. When we have taper refunds, it's intermittent, it's, un it's not guaranteed. It just happens in certain years, um, in certain conditions. Basically, when real economic growth is bigger than population plus inflation. We're seeing that more and more um, all, all the time in Colorado. Because Colorado is growing, there's real growth, but the state doesn't get to benefit from that growth and make those investments in the things we want, K-12, higher ed, transportation. I think it's one, if Prop CC passes, um, we'll sort of head down one avenue to figure out 
what else Colorado needs to do. If Prop CC doesn't pass, we're just going to be in the same situation of underfunding and important public public goods. So, uh, you know, what will happen in 2020, I just don't know right now. I quickly do want to address these guys saying, oh, you know, this transportation money isn't going to transportation. Absolutely not true. He, um, uh, the former Speaker McNulty mentioned faster fees. When faster fees were passed in the legislature, I wasn't there. Every single one of those faster dollars is going to um, transportation. They say, oh, well, when Ref C passed, money was supposed to go to transportation. It is. But Ref D, proposed in 2005, didn't pass. That was the transportation measure. The other thing is, oh, well, we're not bonding enough. I don't want to be bonding if I don't have to. Bonding is a cost. It's a financing mechanism that helps financiers. If we don't have to bond, let's not bond. Let's spend that money where we could. Just saying that um, let's let's spend it when we get it. And you know, saying that we're not bonding is no answer to do we have enough money in transportation. So every single commitment we've said would go into transportation has gone into transportation. But it's still not enough to respond to the growth that Colorado is experiencing. Um, and be, again, t the gas tax in 1992 was 22 cents a gallon. The gas tax today in 2019 is 22 cents a gallon. States all around us, Republican states, Democrat states, have increased their gas tax. Um, the transportation measure that was, both transportation measures on the ballot last year didn't pass. We just can't have the things we want in this state if we're not willing to invest in them. And I don't want to increase, I'm not proposing to increase taxes, I'm just saying let's keep the money we're already getting. This year, um, this coming budget year, we expect taper refunds, and we don't have them every year, but we expect taper refunds, the, the estimates keep changing, but between four and five hundred million dollars. It's a lot of it's a lot of money in this coming year. I don't know if it'll happen the year after that. Uh, if um, if if we don't pass Prop CC, that money will go back to voters in various ways. But most voters won't ever see a penny of that, depending on how the taper refund mechanism works. That changes regularly. So I just want to say, can we take that money that you've already sent us and spend it on the things we most need? public education and transportation. Madam Speaker, if these are things that we most need, then why are we not paying for them out of existing state revenues and federal funds that are coming in um, in companion to that? Yeah. I think that's a good question. You didn't ask the question before. <laughs> um, so we are meeting our Amendment 23 obligations as defined by law. That's how we're supposed to spend in K-12. However, there was a little creative um, decision making uh, back when we had a um, decline in, when we had a recession and the state didn't have enough money to meet Amendment 23. So we now have something called the negative factor. The, U the state Supreme Court approved it but said, um, you know, here's how we, what we originally thought Amendment 23 was going to fund. Uh, we think, yes, the state can't meet all of that. <clears throat> so we're going to redefine that Amendment 23. The difference is called the negative factor. We want to be putting all that money back into K-12. Why are we not? And most of the growth in the budget, those federal, are federal funds. Those federal funds are dedicated, right? That money has to be spent on healthcare, it's not that we get to decide. That money has to be spent, you know, if it's federal mineral lease money in particular ways. If it's um, payments in lieu of taxes that the federal government pays to um, the state for the counties that mostly have federal land, that money has to be spent in particular ways. If it's money that's going um, to uh, for our federal labs or complementing efforts we have in different businesses, or government projects, that has to be spent in that way. So all of that money is dedicated to specific uses. It's not fungible. It can't be just spent any way we want. And, um, having spent the last almost decade working on government efficiency, so how do we actually try and work to make governments actually more efficient? Um, you're not going to squeeze the funding out of efficiency gains in government to solve some of our biggest value 
um, and, and core decisions that we have. At a state level, we are making value choices. Do we believe in a public education system that brings opportunity for all Coloradans? Do we believe in a transportation system that actually provides for the transportation network that we need to have businesses in Colorado? Do we believe in a higher education system that isn't financed off the student loans in the backs of Coloradans, making us much less competitive with other states across the country? And so it comes down to a question of, what are you gonna cut? And I think that's an important question that we need to have answered here of where are you going to find the, the billion of billions of dollars for transportation? Where are you going to find the new dollars to actually bring our education system up to the level that we all value and want it to be? Either you're going to cut or you don't actually share those shared values. But, um, to answer your question, the next step is a full repeal of Tabor uh, in 2020. Uh, I know uh, Carol over there is working hard on that. Uh, I'm sure there's some conservatives who would love to help you gather signatures for that ballot issue, given that uh, we'd love to have that on the ballot. But um, it's full repeal of Tabor. And if you look back in 1992, uh, when Tabor passed, the opponents uh, of Tabor said that there would be chaos that we would be closed for business as a state. They said that, that uh, the Pope wouldn't be safe uh, when he moved, when he had a trip here in 1993. Uh, the Pope was fine, he lived several years after that. Um, but these, these claims that things are horrible, that things, uh, we don't have money for anything, have been going on for a lot of years. We have the number one economy in the country. We have unemployment a little over 3%. We have uh, one of the places, we were ranked late recently for one of the best places uh, to find a job for job seekers. And so they want to go after Tabor. Tabor is extremely popular. Uh, it starts off plus 21%. If you explain what Tabor is to somebody, uh, the numbers go up huge amount. So uh, I know there's several people in this room who do not like Tabor, but the average Coloradan out there, and I trust the average Coloradan to make these decisions, they like Tabor. And in terms of efficiency in government. I mean, education, I'm a former teacher. I taught fourth grade, sixth grade. And looking at education budget and saying, we only spend 54% of the money that we spend on education goes to instruction. So that's where teachers are. Uh, if you go next door to Nebraska, 64% of their dollars go to instruction. So if we did what Nebraska does, right, we would have 815 million more dollars to give to teachers. Uh, we have to have a, a look at our state budget in terms of what are we spending on education, where is that money going, where is the transportation money going, what are the promises that were made. And just to be honest, the average voter is going to look at that and say, they need to do a lot better job before we do any tax increase. We got average voters. Okay. Um, so um, our polling shows something different. Our polling shows something different. Um, when you ask people, you know, can we keep the money we're already collecting and spend it on public education and transportation? They say yes. I think he's right. A lot of people do like Tabor. We're not amending Tabor. We're not changing Tabor. We're doing what Tabor says. Go ask voters. That's exactly what we're asking. That's exactly what we're doing. And actually, just real quick, I do want to ask people, because I've heard the word thrown around a couple of times. Do you all know what debrucing means? Yes. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Usually I end up having to explain it, so um, that's perfect. But so I wanted to ask the opponent. So um, you know, Colorado's local districts have uh, asked to debruce, which is essentially what they're asking for the statewide level. So all uh, but four of Colorado's 178 school districts have already debruced, and 85% of municipalities and 51 of the 64 counties have already done this. So it seems like it's pretty popular uh, at the local level. So I wanted to know, do you think that was the wrong call locally? And if not, what is different about debruising the state? Sure, I think any, um, any debruising effort that you have, or any tax increase in general, if something is local, it's specific, and it's sunset, um, it has a good chance of passing. You look at it and say, uh, in Colorado Springs, they raised taxes for roads, they said it's five years, it's these roads, and you can hold people accountable. Uh, it's true, 61% of tax increases on the local level pass. I think those battles and discussions should happen at the local level. People know their school district, they know their local officials, and say, you know, we trust them with more money or we don't. Uh, more times than not, that has happened. Uh, I think the total difference is on the state level, as we mentioned, all of them lose. And it's because they don't trust state government because of what they've done over a period of time. Um, you look at, you know, you can pull these on a local level, they're gonna pull really high. 
the actual polling on CC right now is below 50%, and that is because people don't trust government for the reasons that we're talking about. So I think that local discussion is a healthy one to have. People can have those, you know, and, and I'd say it depends on your locality and how well they do with it, uh, but statewide, uh, I think the answer has been clear, and I think it will be again this year. I think we have very different polling, um, so you can say yours. Ours is uh, much um, different. I think he said we want to see it local and we want to see it specific. I'll give you local. Guess what? Tabor has been proposed in several other states and it has either never passed or it got repealed. No one has followed the Colorado model because it means you are limited in the public services you can offer. Specific? We are very specific in this ballot measure and he's saying, well, you can't guarantee it. So you can't have it both ways. Um, and in terms of this ballot measure, local decisions about school funding are made at the local level. That is still the case with this ballot measure. And specifically on the transportation, I can't remember, but I think it's 38% of money on transportation in this ballot measure um, goes specifically to local governments to decide how to spend the money. Sorry, I'm um, I mean, I think why the local governments have done this is they've seen the same thing that we all just saw, is that the formula under Tabor is not actually a good approximation for anything, really. Um, if we really want to actually um, talk about what is a right measure to limit growth on government, we can have that discussion, and I'm sure we're probably going to come out with an outcome that's very different from what we currently have. And that's what local governments have seen, is that when you have rising costs in healthcare and other sectors that maybe are not at the local government level, but especially in education and transportation, um, that this actually doesn't account for um, what we should actually have as an adequate size of government. So I think um, the local governments are setting a very good example for where the state should be going, is that they're realizing that this artificial cap that was really intended to both um, not limit government, but actually reduce government arbitrar ar ar arbitrarily um, is something that we need to take up. So I think there is a fundamental difference between um, the role and function of local governments, the role and function of state government, and the role and function of the federal government. I think the federal government should do less. It should take care of these really big things that those of us can't take care of amongst each other. The state government takes care of that next level of things that we can't take care of. And when we talk about local governments, whether it's our counties or our cities and towns, those are the uh, forms of government that are going to be the most involved. So I do understand why the public looks at cities and towns and counties and says, we are going to trust you. We're going to do Bruce you as a local government, because that is the government that is closest to them, that has the greatest impact on their lives, on their daily lives, on our daily lives. So I do understand why local governments have the trust of the people in ways that the state doesn't, and in ways that the federal government doesn't. They all serve different roles, and they're all in tune with our needs as citizens, as their constituents, differently. So it makes absolute sense to me. I don't see anything wrong with it. I understand why voters will take that path. So um, we kind of danced around this a little bit, but for Tyler and Casey, I wanted to ask, um, so Colorado's budget grew by more than a billion dollars last year. And it's almost doubled over the last decade, growing from 19 billion to 32.5. So why are those increases in state revenues enough to cover all the things that we need? Oh, Tyler's welcome to answer this. So um, a lot of that revenue gain is specified for particular uses. Um, again, the federal government says this is how you get more money from us. This is how you're going to spend it. Um, one thing that Tabor does is it, it forces a lot of um, creativity in your budget. And because of some, uh, I would say, creative accounting, um, the state was actually allowed to keep additional revenue that we hadn't been able to keep in the past. And that revenue, that when that bill passed two years ago, it all went to transportation. Um, it also went to help, it essentially went to go help 
fund our underfunded pension system. We think that we are still, however, underfunding transportation, $9 billion backlog. The money that we did um, collect in additional revenue is still not enough for that. We still think we're underfunding higher ed and K-12. My, I live in the best funded school district in the state, Boulder Valley School District. My second graders, class size 29 kids. I can barely handle two of my own kids. 29 kids. So again, those decisions on how that money is spent is made at the local level. We do not dictate any of that. Colorado's kind of, um, uh, that's not how a lot of states operate. A lot of those decisions are made at the state level in other states, but not in Colorado. I want to see those class sizes um, decreased. My school district has um, put a lot into things like special ed and, and gifted and talented, which I, I value. Um, I think if they want to do all of these things, they're going to need additional revenue, and I think they're all worthwhile. Um, and I just wanted to go to the numbers. I think it's a culmination of the discussions that have happened today. So when we talk about a budget of $32 billion, that's not actually um, revenue that can be just moved around in different ways. So the largest portions of those budget are actually related to tuition fees for higher education and the hospital provider fee that cannot be actually used for different parts of the state budget. It's actually being able to use for drawing down different parts. So when we're actually talking about what's in play in a given year to actually solve some of our larger issues, it's the general fund budget, which is $12 billion. And that isn't growing in those dramatic ways that we've talked about because precisely we have these revenue limits and um, kind of the ratchet down periods of how we actually look at um, you know, revenue spending in general. So what that means is that when we're actually trying to make decisions about um, what priorities we want in our budget, legislators are actually looking at a very small slice of the budget in each and every year. They're not given this whole swath to say, let's just move around and try and solve one problem from the other. And the other thing I just say on that is that because we're looking at things like fees, we're actually looking at a diff different style of government where everything is based upon a user fee and not actually based upon kind of larger public investment. So the trend of seeing higher tuition fees in our higher education system, I think should actually be an alarming thing for us, um, meaning that students are actually taking out higher student debt, less able to enter in the market in a competitive way, less able to really ra raise their families in the way that they traditionally want to, making us less competitive as a state overall compared to other states that are actually putting dollars into their institutions of public education. So let's let's talk about the numbers. And um, uh, the speaker is, is right, as she uh, usually is about these things. Um, Tyler, I appreciate your talking points and in, in, in addressing some of, some of the intricacies of the state budget. And it is true. There are really big pieces of the state budget that legislators can't touch. But understand that when the state of Colorado increases eligibility for publicly funded health care. The state obligates dollars to that. And that is a dollar for dollar trade against other things that the state wants to do. So you can't tell me that there's not enough money. It's just a question of how are you spending that money. And I understand where uh, the speaker and Tyler may have different priorities than, than I do. And that's why we have elections, and that's why the Democrats are in control of the House and the Senate and have the governor's office now. But understand that those decisions are made, and those priorities are made. It's not a question of growth, and growth driving all of these things. From 1993 to 2000, we had 780,000 additional people move to the state of Colorado. During that same time, the state budget overall grew by about $4 billion. If we look at the general fund, it grew by $2 billion. Contrast that with the time period that we had from 2012 to 2019, where we had 580,000 people move to the state of Colorado, and the state budget went from $20.58 uh, to $32.52 the general fund 
went from $7.5 billion to $12.2 billion. With 200,000 fewer people moving into our state. So when people tell you that this is simply a function of more people moving to Colorado, it is true people are coming here, but these are the priorities that are being set by the legislature. In 2012, we passed a budget out of the State House, 64 to 1. 64 Republicans and Democrats voted for a state budget. Nobody had seen such a thing in their lifetime. It was so unusual that when the governor signed the budget, we had a party and somebody brought in a cake with a vote on it. It is possible to align the priorities, the policy priorities, of Republicans and Democrats. The important thing is to get there is that those policy priorities are brought together in a state budget. It can be done, it has been done, and I believe that it can be done again. Even with these deep divisions that we have across our politics and our society, on Facebook, whatever that is, people tell me about it. These things can be resolved. And my hope is that they are. The money is there, the numbers don't prove out many of the allegations that are made. We simply need to address priorities equally. And that's what our state policymakers ought to be doing. There's some clapping back there. There you go. Um, I think the budget is much bigger as we've gone over. And even uh, there's a Denver Post editorial uh, maybe a month and a half ago or so. Um, but the Denver Post, not typically Tabor supporters, still not Tabor supporters, but basically said, we are no longer convinced that the state needs more revenue for the general fund for the reasons that Speaker McNulty was talking about, how much it has grown. Um, I believe that tax policy matters. Um, it has real implications within states. I grew up in Illinois, and every time they want something new, they raise taxes. And what has that done? 100,000 net people are leaving that state every year. Right? Their credit rating is the worst in the country. It's why I care so much about Tabor here in Colorado. But that, that does matter, and I think there is some unity in terms of fiscal tax policy with Republicans and Governor Polis, who wants to cut the tax rate three to five percent and close some loopholes to pay for some of it. But I think there is there is unity there um, because he understands that taxes matter. You can chase people out of a state. You can chase productive businesses out of a state. Uh, and the lower the taxes, the better off we are. We believe in investment. We believe in using that investment wisely. And I think when you go back to education, as I mentioned, being a teacher, looking at education budget, since 1990, our education dollars have gone up adjusted for inflation by 20%. Teacher pay is down 20% during that same time. We're spending more money on education. It's not getting the teachers where people want it to be. Can I ask one? Sure. Um, I'm from Colorado. I believe very highly in tax policy as an important expression of our values and our institutions. And I very much believe Colorado should be the most competitive state across the country. And when you look at what drives businesses to different locations, and we'll take them. We'll take the U.S. News and Report, hopefully one of the most basic, um, where we said it's the number one economy in the country. What brings business to different states? If you were to look at just the tax burden for those different areas, none of the lowest tax burden states are high on the actual list of business environment. What drives businesses to different states across the country is, do you have the infrastructure that supports my business? Do you have the school system that's gonna support my employees? Do you have the higher education system where I'm gonna get employees that are gonna be very well qualified to actually take the jobs that I'm producing? Do we have a system that's actually fair across the board? Do we have do we have inequities across our state that are actually going to drive problems for me doing business here? And when you take those factors in, we're doing well now. But if we're not investing in our higher education system, our public um, infrastructure, we are at a deep disadvantage. And I think the value that I, I worry about is when you actually take the U.S. News and Reports rankings, we're ranked in the lowest, lowest, but I think it's we're 42nd in the country when it comes to equity across the board. So when it comes to Colorado, it's highly dependent upon where your zip code is, how well your opportunities are going to be across.
across the state. And that is deeply embedded in our tax system. If you look at taper and what it actually taxes and doesn't allow you to tax, it is something that is driven to actually protect wealthy individuals from actually having to be taxed at different rates, where it's spreading kind of the biggest burden on average to low-income individuals across the state. And that, I think, is a fundamental problem that Prop CC isn't just addressing, but we need to have that continued discussion in our state moving forward. So I want to ask kind of a specific question uh, that I know Carol touched on during her presentation. So uh, Tabor does use the consumer price index to determine how much of a, a refund or a rebate, depending on what word you want to use, you get back. Um, so for as an example, uh, between May of 2018 and May of 2019, uh, inflation rose by 1.6%. Uh, but during the same time, health insurance inflation grew by 10.7%. So it is growing slower than the rate that the the state would pay for health insurance and other uh, programs. So why should the state have to grow at a slower rate than the rising costs of the services it provides? Um, because the state is inherently inefficient in the way that it goes about doing its business. Um, I think, um, I'm, I'm going to flip that question a little bit and uh, answer it this way. I think that uh, any measure that is an honest calculation of growth from year to year of expenses is something that we ought to consider. And I say honest calculation because with any formula, you can skew it frontwards or backwards. You can skew it to one side or the other. But if you have conservative economists coming together with liberal economists and developing a calculation that is a true reflection, of how much more expensive things are getting from year to year, or um, how much things ought to, to change from year to year, then I think that's something worth considering. The CPI is a formula, it is a measure that exists, and that's why it was hacked. But I think if, if we have a conversation, if you get people who are really smart about this stuff to, to develop some other type of formula for us to gauge this by, I think that's great. Let's do it. But we ought not throw out the CPI simply because um, it, it, it doesn't measure up to the growth that some people would want. It is an accurate reflection, it is meaningful, and it is what we have now. Um, the thing I'll add to that, it's just, I think anytime that people are talking about the formula, it is a way to try to come up with a measure that will get them more money. I think that's the first thing, um, which, you know, you can want that or not, but I think it's a it's a healthy discussion to have on is this the right formula. Um, I think the problem is that we have fees and enterprises that are going around this whole system anyway, right? That's where a lot of this growth is happening, is the fees and enterprise area and saying, you know what, if we want to trade, um, we're not going to do a billion dollar family leave tax, you know, that's supposed to be a fee or whatever to get around going to a vote. Uh, I think those are conversations that could, could happen. Um, but knowing that this is just a way to get around, I, I, and on that, I think in the fees and, and uh, enterprise discussion um, it is something that is a problem with Tabor right now in that the courts have said that you can do that. Um, I think the next ballot issue from our side after uh, we hopefully defeat Prop CC would be have some kind of ballot issue that says if a fee amounts to 50 or 100 million dollars, that has to go to the people in order to vote uh, because they're just, they're just getting around it now and ignoring it anyway. So I think a, a healthy discussion, if everybody's going to be honest and come to the table and say, you know what, we need to change the formula and this is a, a good measure and smart people come and do that, I don't think our side would have a problem. There was a proposal in the legislature two years to do that. I think two Republicans voted for it. Two. It didn't get through the Senate. So I, I don't, I mean, I'd love to see the proposal and come forward and, and do it. Um, I don't think the legislature actually wants to keep passing fees, you know, an increased fee for, for, for a, tuition, for instance. I think what we're saying is, again, here's what the income tax rate is. Let's um, be able to keep that money that we're already collecting. Oh, the, you know, the, there is um, growth in the state that is leading to higher wages for many people, and I think that's a very good thing. What's happening is the state cannot, cannot actually compete with that because we don't get to um, 
TAPER prohibits that. So for instance, we have hundreds of job openings in our prisons right now. That is not a good situation. But people can leave those, those jobs and take better paying jobs in the private sector. We are, as Anna pointed out, we just can't keep up as a state with the cost of health care. And the cost of construction is for you know roads and bridges is higher than population plus inflation. So the things that the state pays for are growing faster than what the state is allowed to keep under Tabor. That is a fundamental structural problem that is gonna drive us into the ground. We have got to address that. It is unsafe to have all those um, openings in our, in our prisons. It is not a good idea right now we are able to inspect oil and gas facilities as much as we want because those jobs are open because they're all going to the private sector. I'm happy for them if they can make more money, but this state has to be able to compete and Tabor prevents us from competing and therefore doing the basic things that we're supposed to be doing. I would just add, I, I don't think there is a lot of justification for CPI plus 2% growth rates. I mean, I think we can come up with a lot of different measures that would better adequately look to based upon the priorities. And I do think it's a, it is a, an ongoing discussion of what are our priorities as a state and what does actually um, the amount of government that needs to grow within those priorities look like. Um, but CPI plus 2% has never been an adequate measure of that. And I think we've seen that, especially as we priority of actually being able to provide affordable health care to all Coloradans um, and that actually exceeding what's to be done. That's a policy decision. That's a policy decision that you, you want to propose and you want to, you want to advocate for. Well, what uh, we're advocating is going to voters. What we're advocating for is going to voters and asking them to do this. Well, I, I would say what's the policy decision behind CPI plus 2%? That's, that's what we have. I know. I'm saying we so don't should not like what we have. Let's come up with a better formula. Let's not let's not hang it on the hat of CPI is not enough to pay for universal health care. That formula would have to go to voters anyway. I, that's what I believe. We, if that's what you're going to propose, propose it. But we have got to fix this problem. Just you know, saying there isn't a problem isn't going to help us. This, we're driving the state into the ground, and I think that was the original intent of Tabor. What I think is insane is like, oh, we don't want government to grow. I'm talking about construction jobs. I'm talking about people working on roads and bridges and transit. That is construction jobs. If you want to call that government growth, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I'm talking about hiring teachers in our schools. I mean, these are just basic functions that the state is responsible for. And we cannot right now cover the needs that people are asking us to deliver with this current constitutional restriction that prohibits the state from growing with the economy. It just doesn't make any sense. So we hear this often. Um, the state is on a collision course with financial disaster, with fiscal disaster. Um, we're going to drive the state. The state is going to be driven into the ground because it doesn't have enough money to spend. When I came into the legislature in 2007, we were at the very front end of the Great Recession. When I was elected Speaker of the House in 2011, we were in the middle of the Great Recession, where we were actually cutting the budget. This is not cuts, reductions in the rate of increase from year to year. So we were slated to go from 5%, so we only grew at 3%. That's not what we were doing. We were cutting funding from year to year. And fortunately, we had a better revenue estimate in 2011, and we were able to put about 300 million back into K through 12 education, and that helped a great deal. But we're still here. We're still standing, our state is still functioning, we have the number one economy, in the country. And it bothers me to say that that's happened under Democratic leadership. 
<laughs> no, I like speak. I like speak. Speak, speaker, speaker Becker. You see, she. Um, I, 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 I wish I compliment you the way she runs the house. She's clever. She's self-deprecating, and yet she keeps control of, of the chamber and doesn't let the animals rule the uh, the zoo. So I, I do. I appreciate the work of uh, Speaker Becker. The point. The point is this. The legislature has the obligation to prioritize spending. Some years there will be more money. Some years there will be less money. But that doesn't mean that our state is going to be driven into financial ruin. I think one of the challenges that we have directly in front of us that the legislature um, ha has, has started to, to identify as a priority, and I'm grateful for it, is transportation. When you talk about higher education and, and, and graduating the best and the brightest, and I agree with all of that. Moving more money into the classrooms, I think we need to do a better job of that. That's not the state legislature's prior, that's not the state legislature's job, that's the job of local school districts, and they need to do a better job of that. But we need to address transportation. If we are not able to move goods and services, to move people safely and efficiently across the four corners of our state, our economy will suffer. Businesses will find someplace else to go. People will stop coming to Colorado. We're not going to see the 780,000 increase or the 580,000 increase. For those of you who remember Governor Lamb, Governor Lamb had the, the, the policy position. If we don't build it, they won't come. They came, and they kept coming, and they kept coming. And we have to keep up with this growth. And the way that we do that is by prioritizing transportation funding within the state budget. That's what we need to do. So um, I wanted to ask, uh, back in 2005, um, former Colorado Governor Bill Owens um, arguably forfeited his political career to pass Proposition Z, uh, and that was a temporary Tabor uh, timeout. So it's what you're asking, except it was only five years, and you're asking for forever. Um, so I wanted to, so Owens has recently come out in opposition to CC, saying that he understands the difference between short-term adjustments during funding crisis and permanent blank checks that the state government too often wishes it could write itself. So I wanted to ask uh, the supporters why why you think the permanent solution is the right way to go rather than like what CC did back in 2005. I think this problem exists today. It does. It's going to exist in 10 years if we don't solve it. Putting a a, a limit will ask you again. Um, is it's just challenging to go to voters on these things. It's challenging to run um, campaigns. I think we just need to fix it once and for all. And I have a real quick comment to Frank's. So we've got the number one economy. And by the way, thank you for the compliment. He, he ran a very good house as well. Thank you, thank you for the economy. <laughs> um, why do we have the number one economy in the country, but we're 45th in terms of funding K-12 education? Why is CU Boulder, the money that it gets from the state is less than 5%? Why do we have a $9 million backlog in terms of transportation? And it's, you know, almost our entire budget in the state goes to three things, right? It's, it's prisons, it's healthcare, it's um, education, and, and some human services. We, it's not, I, like, the, the, for the last several years, there have been just as many Republicans on the Joint Budget Committee as there were Democrats on the Joint Budget Committee. They didn't find those cuts. They didn't find them. I'm just that we don't need to wait for the next recession to be able to work on making Colorado a better place. We need to actually be preparing for the next recession by investing in Colorado today so that the problem is not worse when we get to that point. If we wait for our house to be falling over to actually invest in it, we're spending twice as much if we were actually making preventative measures moving forward. And that's what we have the opportunity to do today, is that when the economy is strong, how do we actually take advantage of it, and more importantly, make it work for all of Colorado. So I love that we are the number one economy in, in the country right now, 
but I am deeply troubled about opportunity for our next generation. And that includes my son and daughter, whether or not they're gonna have an education system that's gonna provide them the opportunities that they need for the future. And I think that's the opportunity that we're asking right now is while the economy is doing well and we have this opportunity, let's make those investments so we're not paying double in the future. I just, one more thing about why, we don't know how often TABOR refunds will happen. It's very intermittent. Um, we could put a five-year time out on this and then never have a TABOR refund and then have to go back to the ballot. Um, because it's intermittent and uncertain, it's just a way of saying on the margins, when times are good, can the state keep that money and spend it on public priorities? That's all. If we may, we're projecting taper refunds this next year, depending on what happens with the economy, and no one can predict it. If they, those refunds may exist or not exist. Let's just say, let's get rid of these taper refunds that, by the way, you all never really get because they're spent in, you, Republicans propose different ways, Democrats propose different ways of refunding that money. Let's just spend it on the priorities that folks have identified time and time again. $400 million, if that's what we have in taper refunds for this coming year, will go a lot towards public education and roads. But spread across <clears throat> millions of Coloradans, it doesn't go that far. It might buy you a state dinner. I want to see us make long-term investments in the things that matter so that we are leaving a state that is better than the one that we inherited. I've got kids, you all probably have kids, and some of you probably have grandkids. We have an obligation to leave that, this state better than we got it. That's what this argument is about. Um, we were really excited to get uh, former Governor Bill Owens and uh, former Senator Hank Brown, both who uh, advocated for, campaigned for Ref C back uh, in, in 2005, uh, on our side on this one because looking at, um, and, and they said this, you, look, you talk to, to former Senator uh, Hank Brown and he said, we were told that we would get as a higher, he was at higher education, uh, University of Colorado and Northern Colorado, so we were told we were gonna get more money. Uh, they took that money away from us, did not go to higher education. Um, knowing that money's fungible, he didn't get it and that's why he came out against it. Uh, former Governor Bill Owens said, this money is supposed to go to transportation he leaves office, it doesn't go there. Uh, and so looking at this saying it's permanent, we have a growing budget, our budget's going up every year, we don't need this right now. And I, I wanna talk, we don't have a problem with letting people vote. This is great, this is a great discussion to have, it is a great thing to be talking about right now. I'd love if the legislature put on the tax cut that Governor Polis wants onto the ballot so people could vote on that too. Uh, I don't have a problem having this conversation with people. I have a problem with the legislature doing what they did in, in the state that I grew up in, Illinois, uh, and just raising taxes whenever they want. So that's why I really appreciate Tabor. We get to weigh in, we get to have these conversations. This doesn't change anything about that. This doesn't change anything about it. It simply says, without raising taxes, may the state keep the money it's already collecting and spend it on public education and roads, bridges, and transit. It's that easy. So actually that does lead into a question I wanted to ask because a lot of the opposition to CC uh, calls it a tax increase. I've even seen some fun flyers from AFP with like, you know, somebody pickpocketing your wallet. Uh, so because it does start without raising taxes, uh, and can you explain why you think that language is correct or incorrect? Oh, I, I think it's incorrect and I think the standard that I would use, it's the only thing that I learned in law school, but there's a reasonable person and if you talk to a reasonable person and you said, if you take, keep, and spend more money as the state government, is that a tax increase? Everybody almost is gonna say yes. So I think you look at it, they're taking, they're, they're, they're taking that money, they're keeping it, they're spending it, they're not returning it to you. This is $1.3 billion over the next three years, money that should go back to the people uh, in refunds. And so I think just the average person, the reasonable uh, person, if you talk to them, would say this is absolutely a tax increase. It's not a tax increase. We can't actually increase taxes without going to voters and asking, asking to increase taxes. The state sales tax is gonna still be 2.9%. The state income tax is still gonna be 4.63%. It's just not a tax increase. The money that is collected, it's, people have gotten Tabor refunds for four years since Tabor has passed, four years. Typically what that done is done is the legislature finds different 
um, tax exemptions, credits, and deductions that go to certain interest groups. I'm, Michael and I have had this conversation. He knows I'm not a fan of that. Um, but um, what we want to do is say, let's not do that anymore. Let's just simply have it go to what our state priorities are. I think actually we're saying the exact same thing. The state should be prioritizing. I want to take that taper uh, refund money when it happens and put it in our, our priorities. And let's ask voters to do that. I'm not taking any more money out of your pocket. I'm saying what you're already writing to us. Can we keep and spend it on state priorities? So um, I know we've talked a lot about education and about hiring teachers. And I did want to ask, um, so this money has got to be one-time money, right? Because it's not going to carry year to year. And so how do you make sure or what kind of assurances do you have that districts won't become reliant on it after, say, a few good years? Like, how do you, you because the legislature is limited in what they can do with local districts, how, like, they shouldn't be using this money to hire teachers. I mean, just, so we, the language just say it has to be spent on non-recurring expenses. Um, I, I, and we listed some things that um, it's, you know, including but not limited to, and we specify things that, um, that are actually in the classroom. But ultimately, decisions are made at the local level by local school boards. Uh, so I was just uh, told that we only have a few minutes left. So I wanted to give each of you a chance, kind of like one or two minutes, to give your best elevator pitch to the group about why they should or shouldn't vote for this measure. So uh, who wants to be brave and start? <laughs> and I'll just set a timer. Um, I'll, I'll just come back to it. I do think we are talking about priorities as a state. And I think one of the, the biggest priorities that I personally have is keeping Colorado competitive for many generations to come. And I think that really means that we are investing in our public institutions and public infrastructure to ensure that businesses are actually coming to the state and that future generations are able to take advantage of education and other opportunities. And it doesn't matter that you're born in one zip code versus another, that we see opportunity across the state. And when it comes to Proposition CC, we shouldn't wait for bad times to be making just tax policy. We should take advantage of good economies to actually making the investments in tomorrow that actually re reduce the cost over time. We all want a prosperous state. The road to prosperity in Colorado is by investing in um, important infrastructure, like transportation and like public education. If we can keep the money we're already collecting in good years and put it into those things, everyone in the state is going to be better off. Um, very happy to live in, in Colorado. Uh, it's a great state. It is a state that is doing very well. Uh, part of that reason is because of our Taxpayers' Bill of Rights, which is very popular. Uh, a few points on Prop CC, uh, remembering that there's no guarantee where this money goes. It's a blank check. Um, that it is a, a tax increase and six straight tax hikes have been uh, knocked down at the ballot. And our budget's growing every year. It's growing by over a billion dollars and we're not putting it into the things that we need to put it into. If there is a priority on transportation and on education and getting money in the classroom, we should do that. And then once we do that, people will trust state government more. And so uh, that refund money that is coming to you, hopefully 575 million dollars uh, this year and over 300 million for the next few years. Uh, that's going to be money that is going to go back into the pockets of families and really make a difference for them. How long is my elevator ride? Are we talking from like the ground floor to the penthouse or are we just like three floors? The Taxpayers Bill of Rights has quite literally saved the state of Colorado. When times are good, it keeps state spending in check through these revenue levels. When time, when the economy is off, and you state government inevitably has to start reducing spending, Tabor has the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights has made sure that we haven't hit the peak of what the state of Colorado is able to spend. There are serious challenges with our state budget, and I am not jealous of our lawmakers who have to deal with these things. Parrot, the Public Employees Retirement System, is one of the greatest challenges that the legislature will have to face. It is one of the reasons why our school districts are in financial straits, because they continue to pay 
a larger and larger percentage of their local budgets to keep up.